Merry Christmas. Welcome to our online church. Uh, my name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community. And we welcome you, and we want to let you know that peace has come. Peace has come has been our Christmas series these past couple of weeks. And I was thinking about um, one time, one year, a few, it was actually a few years ago, Joanna and I, my wife and I, we visited some other churches for Easter and Christmas. And during those visits, we actually found something very surprising. At a holiday service in this church, Jesus did not rise from the tomb on Easter, and he wasn't born at the Christmas Eve service. And we laughed and we asked each other, did you notice that they didn't tell the story? And we thought, you know, what if this was the only church service that you had been to all year, and now you're leaving without the knowledge that the Savior was born and that peace had come? Do you think it's possible to get through the entire holiday season and to not hear the Christmas story? That shouldn't happen. In Luke chapter 2, the angels tell the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The good news of Christmas is that peace has come. Not that peace is coming and it's in the far off distant future, or that peace has come and gone. Christmas brought peace. That was the good news. The world was in darkness, the world was in turmoil, and it was waiting for peace. And the Bible records that after the shepherds saw the Christ child, it says they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They saw, and then they told the story. And now, you and I, we have four accounts of this story. We have four Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four writers, four authors. And then within those pages, we have countless more stories. Not just the Christmas story. But the sad thing is, even though Christmas is one of the most important stories, we never preach the Christmas story during the year. We always save it till December. We wait until now. So I hope you agree with me that if we're going to wait and tell this story in December, we should at least be telling the story as much as we can and to not forget it. And we should tell it correctly. I think what happens is we, we preachers, we get bored of the story and we have to tell it every year. You know, it's like asking Paul Anka to sing my way one more time. How many times do you think Elvis sang, I can't help falling in love? So every year, preachers try to be creative and they try to find new ways to put a, a new spin on the old Christmas story. And they'll say, oh, this year we're gonna look at the innkeeper. This year we're gonna study the little drummer boy. This year we're gonna study the story from the perspective of the donkey. We're gonna look at the three gifts this year. Maybe we'll talk about prophecy one year. Next year, the angels. If your preacher is really kooky, he'll do an entire sermon about Herod. But in trying to be creative, we can also end up forgetting to tell the actual story. Not here, not this season. We're gonna make sure that you hear it several times. And lately we've been focusing on an author who knew the story forward and backward, a man named John, who eventually became the adopted son of Mary. And this is how John writes his Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. 
he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will, of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. No wise man, no donkey, no innkeeper, and yet it's still a story about love and hope and peace. Everything that Christmas is about. And then he ends, he ends his story like this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Maybe John did know the story of the shepherds and the inn that had no spare rooms, but he chose to focus on the cross and the amazing truth that Jesus came and he lived and he died for you. John wanted you to know that through your belief in your personal savior, you would have eternal life. He said, salvation is based off belief. And he says, so I tell you the story so that you will believe. Because you see, be before Jesus was born, people had all these ideas about who the Messiah would be. Most thought that the Messiah would be a savior, a liberator, somebody like Moses. Moses was a brave leader. He used to walk into throne rooms and make demands in God's name. Moses was, he was an insurgent. He rose up against the government that fed and clothed him. He defied the powers that be and he demanded change. He led thousands of people out of captivity. And even along the road, he was their general. And he took them into battle and he won several victories. Moses was one of the greatest leaders of Israel and the people probably wanted another Moses. Or maybe they wanted a king like David. When the wise men visit Herod, Herod asks about the prophecy. He asks where the child would be. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Well, Bethlehem is significant because this is King David's homeland. The prophet says in Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jesse is King David's dad. So this Messiah, according to the prophet, is going to be a chip off the old block. David was Israel's greatest war hero and greatest king. The people sang of David. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And when you are an oppressed people group living amongst the heavy imperial wheel of Rome, I bet every day you are praying for a Messiah who will strike down tens of thousands of enemies. Even Jesus his own disciples, who lived with him, heard him preach, they had the wrong idea about him. When the disciples came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the time or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, the disciples ask, now, right? It's now? Now is the time that we go to war. Now is the time we're going to rise up against our oppressors. It's time to put our foot down, take back what's ours. Now it's time to be a nation again. And Jesus says, no. You see, we all put Jesus in this box, and we have this idea about who we think Jesus is supposed to be. But Jesus didn't come to be another Moses. And he didn't come to be another David. Everyone had the wrong agenda. And he didn't come to be any of those things. Jesus came to be a savior, a personal savior, and he came to bring you peace. 
John saw it. He witnessed it. And now at 70 years old, he pens his own story to make sure that you know the Christmas story. 2020, what story will we tell there? That was a bad year. I mean, we all looked forward to it, right? But it didn't deliver. It was pretty depressing. We, we probably all know somebody that got sick, and most of us know somebody who died. My friend posted on Facebook uh, this last week. She said, I'm going to stay up on Christmas Eve this year. I don't normally, but I'm going to this year. Not to welcome in the new year, but just to make sure the old one dies. But let me tell you something. John, John fought against an enemy government his entire life. And he was thrown in jail repeatedly. In fact, he was eventually in prison on an island, and, and, and that's where he died. So, so his world was daily torn apart by outside forces. He knew that the world needed a champion who would save the people from Rome. But the real problem wasn't Rome. No, the real problem was our sin. And so God sent a personal savior to bring peace between God and humanity. And if you don't believe John, even though he was there, if you don't want to believe John, you can believe Luke. Believe Luke. Luke starts his story. Insomuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. This is how Luke begins with a prelude that says, you know, I researched all of this. I looked it up. I spoke to witnesses. Most Bible scholars believe Luke interviewed John and he had a copy of Mark's gospel. Luke starts his Christmas story off a little bit more familiar for us. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. Now, this is exactly what I want to talk about for the rest of our time together. Joanna and I have been watching this uh, web series that was created about Jesus, and more importantly, like the people that were around Jesus, who he interacted with. It's called The Chosen. It's really great. And in that, I was really kind of looking forward to, when they got to the Christmas story, how they would interpret this part. But even they, who are trying to be historically accurate, they call him Jesus. The name Jesus is masculine, but it's derived from Greek. It's the Greek word Iesus. It does have a, a J at the beginning, but the J is silent. It's the Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua. What's my point? My point is, when the angel tells Mary what her son's name is going to be, Mary does not hear the word Jesus, and she doesn't hear the word Moses, and she doesn't hear the word David. She hears the name Joshua. Mary heard the name Joshua, a Bible hero, yes, but not like Moses, and not like David. Let's look at Matthew's Christmas story. Now, the birth of Jesus took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Found to be. Found to be, which means she didn't tell anybody, right? So she probably knew 
that if found out, she would have been banished from her community, could have been killed, her own parents could have disowned her, Joseph could have legally divorced her, and he tries, verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So they were legally married, they were promised to one another, and as secret as her pregnancy was, if they got a divorce, it would become public. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, or that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Both Mary and Joseph are told, the name of the Messiah is Joshua. Now, I have two sons, and both of them have my last name. Uh, my father's last name, my grandfather's last name. I have five brothers and sisters, and there are no male grandson Kennys in the family besides mine to carry on the family name. In fact, Dermot, my second son, has the name Dermot literally to carry on Joanna's family name. And as a father, there is pride in legacy, in lineage, in knowing that your sons will carry on. And for Joseph, he too would have had joy knowing that he would have a son to carry on his own family line. But Joseph is told in a dream, Mary is pregnant and this is not your biological son. So you don't get to name him and it's not going to be a family name. Instead, his name will be Joshua, a savior name. So if you're gonna to try to understand what kind of baby this might be, or who he's going to grow up to be, what kind of Messiah we're going to get, then you should look at Joshua. Joshua took the nation of Israel into the promised land. Joshua was a warrior, and it was assumed the new Messiah would also be that kind of leader. But the angel explains, not a warrior. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. He will save. But not from Rome. He's not going to go to war against a human enemy. So why be named after Joshua and not Moses? Certainly, Moses is more popular. Well, it's because Moses led the people out of captivity. That's true, but he died along the way. Hebrews chapter four says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Jesus is the one who brings us to safety, who brings us to rest. He brings us safely to peace. What about David? The second chapter of Luke's Christmas story says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, he's the first king of Rome, that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, which is 100 miles away, and Mary is close to giving birth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So Mary has to deliver in the same town that King David grew up in. And the prophecy is so important that God has the most powerful man alive literally move everybody. And so Jesus is now being moved so that he would be born in the city of David. And Joseph would never have made this trip if it not for this decree. And he goes to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So this is not going to be an easy journey. With Mary, this close to delivery, it's doubtful that she was on a donkey. She was probably being carried in a wagon or she walked. That's a five to eight day journey, probably with a caravan. And if this were happening to me at this time in my life, I'd be asking, why in the world is this happening now? 
This is, the, this is a terrible time for this. You know, why is God doing this to us? We have to go all the way to the city of David just to be counted by the most powerful man alive. This is a complete waste of time. Luke continues, And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Luke tells us about Bethlehem. Luke tells the shepherd story. The angels tell the shepherds about the birth. Mary lays her baby down in a shepherd's trough, the same place a newborn sheep would be placed. And this is how God chooses to announce the birth of his son. To the lowest common denominator, to the people that society had forgotten, a Christmas story about sheep and shepherds, because Jesus later titles himself the Good Shepherd. He says, I am the Good Shepherd, and the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Luke continues his Christmas story. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. A sign for you. Who? Shepherds. <laughs> right? This is the Savior for you. This is how you know he is for you. This is how you'll recognize him when you see him. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. The sign is for you, shepherds. The place you'll find this newborn is in the place where you would find baby lambs, a lamb of God in the trough of a lamb. Jesus is probably named after Joshua because he is our deliverer. And he's born in the city of David because he's our king. But not just that, it's also because before he was king, David was a shepherd. Everyone was expecting one Messiah and they got another, which is why most people didn't recognize him, which is why he was arrested and killed. It's sad, really. Real and eternal peace was right there in front of them, and they decided to settle for the cheap plastic peace from Rome. The good news is the Prince of Peace is still available to us. Luke 2 says, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. I don't know how this all came about for you, how you became a Christian, or I don't know how your story goes personally, but I am not a Christian because I decided to be one. No, I'm a Christian because something happened. Everything Mark, Luke, and John record happened. This story in Matthew happened, right? It actually happened. In the Bible, we have four stories about a carpenter from Nazareth. Why? Because something happened. The people that were there, they saw something happen. And all across the way, people told the story of this happening. Some people even died to make sure that story ended up in your hands. God came and he squeezed himself down into a box and that box was given to you as a gift. Christianity is not an idea. It's not a concept. Something happened. Christmas happened. It says when the shepherds came with haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying 
that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Who knows this story? Who thought about it her entire life? Mary. She raised the Son of God. She taught the Son of God. And then at 33, she watched him die and rise again. And she held her resurrected son, knowing the entire time that this man was her personal Joshua. Matthew did the best he could to write it down. Luke did the best he could to put it all in order. John writes it all down once more, this adopted son of Mary. And John at 70 years old, Mary is long dead. But she told him the story, all her ponderings to him. And John penned the most famous of all Christmas stories. And the one Christmas story that you have memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. A 70-year-old man wrote those words. And 2,000 years later, you memorized them. Why did Jesus come? To bring a sword? To bring war? To fight? To sit on a throne? No. This king came to be the king that we least expected. He came to be a savior, but the savior that we needed the most. John continues, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Well, then tell us why. But in order that the world might be saved through him. That's Christmas. We thought we needed a conqueror, but God knew we really needed peace. The angels told Mary, he will be great and he'll be called son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Who is kingdom? Jesus' kingdom. We all sit here right now, you and I, we are all a part of this kingdom right now. This kingdom that will never end. And that's Christmas too. You know the last line of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is a line about the change that takes place in Ebenezer Scrooge. For, for, for Ebenezer Scrooge that night, something happened. Something happened. He didn't change because he decided to change. He changed because something happened. Dickens writes, it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, and may that be truly said of us and all of us. How do we do that? How do we keep the joy and love and peace of Christmas all year? By keeping Jesus all year. And if you still have not decided to follow, this shepherd savior who brings peace, I can tell you just how easy it is. First, you just admit that you're a sinner and there's no shame in that. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect. If heaven was a reward for perfect people, none of us would go. Romans 3 says all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you decide to follow Jesus, you're still not perfect. But right now, you can be a part of a church who accepts you just like you are, fault and all. A church, all, all a church is, is a family. It's a family made up of people who are also imperfect, who also are broken, but people who've decided that they love their Savior. If you can believe in Jesus, the Bible says, that you can believe that God became a man, that he walked among us, if you can believe that Jesus came to show the world what hope and grace and peace look like, if you can believe that Jesus stands ready to offer you a new life, Jesus is the key. The book of Acts says there is no salvation by anyone else. 
There's no other name under heaven given among people by which they can be saved. So if you can admit that you're a sinner, and if you believe that Jesus is God, you can be saved. It's that easy. Belief and admission, those are the cornerstones of salvation. And then you just confess it. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A new life in Christ is just that easy. And if you're ready for that, this Christmas, if you're ready for the best gift of all, I would invite you to bow your heads and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you, trust you, and become what you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for coming together and watching this service. Of course, it is uh, a YouTube video. So that means there's an address up there at the top. You're more than welcome to clip and copy it, post it to your own social media wall, share it with your friends, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think they might benefit from it. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to this channel so that you receive notifications about when we post, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.